Hey, God bless your family. This is Pastor Larry. And as we always say, this is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Man, listen, I'm excited to have you here on this Monday evening for this edition of Moments in the Word. You don't want to miss tonight's word. I believe by the Spirit of God that it's going to bless your life tremendously and shift your faith into another dimension. And so once you like, share, and subscribe to our page, whatever me social media outlet you're on, like, subscribe, and share this page. All right? Uh, get you a pen, a pad, and stay tuned for tonight's word. Hey, all right, all right. God bless you and again. As we always say, this is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Praise God. This is your host for tonight's edition of Moments in the Word. I'm Pastor Larry, and God bless you. Listen, I want to give some quick shouts out. Hey, is it the Gloria? My mother, how are you, my dear? Love you, girl. God bless you. Uh, Sister Barbara, uh, Minister Gina, Lady Sard, and I see you. Brother Tommy, uh, who else is there? Hey, Pastor Mars, God bless you, sir. Hey, Auntie, I see you there. Sister Arnetta, Sister Cynthia, and all of you all who are here on tonight, we say God bless you. LT, I see you. All right, we say God bless you to all of you all. Listen, thank you all for being a part of tonight's lesson. I believe that it's going to bless your life for the better. As always, we ask you to like, share, and subscribe to this page. Listen, want to connect with you all? If you have an email, it's momentsintheword99 at gmail.com. That's moments in the word, moments with an S, moments in the word 99 at gmail.com. Or you can call our prayer line at 773-785-0412. 773-785-0412. Or call our online number. 
is 708-821-6527. Yes, 708-821-6527. We would love to hear from you. Also want to invite you to join us for this month. This month, we are reading the book of Romans and 1 Corinthians. All right. That's the entire chapter of Romans and the entire chapter of 1 Corinthians. That's our reading for the month of March. You say, Pastor Larry, there's one chapter left over. Read it. <laughs> Praise God. Read it. I believe it'll bless your life for the better. All right. So for the month of March, we are reading the entire chapter of Romans and the entire chapter of First Corinthians. All right. Also, join us tomorrow. That's tomorrow morning at the 10 o'clock hour. If you love prayer, man, listen, tomorrow is going to be great. Join us tomorrow for a time of prayer. Tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, call our uh, conference line. Uh, they'll have it for you up there on the screen. Call that line and be a part of our prayer on tomorrow morning. I believe it's going to be a blessing to your life as well and those in your family. So uh, join us, will you? I think you will be blessed. If you don't want to pray, come on in, mute your phone, and be a part of our time of prayer on tomorrow. All right, you all, I'm ready to get into the word. I pray that you are as well. Let's pray and let's get started. Father of heaven, as always, we thank you so much for this time of your word. I pray that you would bless God, the ears of the hearer. I pray that you would bless my voice, God, my mind, my heart. Father, line my will up with your will. Let me only say what you tell me to say. I bless you. I honor you. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen, amen, and amen. All right, class, come on. Romans, the fourth chapter. Romans 4, look at verse 19. Let's go. Romans 4, look at verse 19. I pray you have your Bibles tonight. Romans 4, look at verse number 19. It says, and being not weak in faith, he, meaning Abraham, considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, meaning God, he was able to perform. Oh, dear God, what an awesome passage of scripture. All right, you all, we're going to get back into our lesson. This is part five of overcoming obstacles that obstruct abundant living. Overcoming obstacles that obstruct abundant living. In other words, it is God's desire that you and I move past those obstacles uh, that keep us from walking in the abundant life Jesus died for us to have. Listen, I'm not sure about you, but I am tired of uh, of God's children barely getting by, barely having enough to pay their rent, barely having enough for their lights, barely buying shoes for their kids. God wants you and I to live the abundant life. And I know this is if there's one thing I know for sure that I believe that everyone tonight in the chat room that you want to live the abundant life. Come on, give me some hearts. I know it's early, but give me some likes. If you want to live the abundant life, shoot up some hearts, some likes right quick, because I know and I believe by the Spirit of God that you want to live the abundant life. God wants to move us from the land of not enough, and we are in the land of just enough, but take us over to the land of more than enough. Come on, I'm going to say it again. God has already brought us from the land of not enough and put us in the land of just enough. But now in this last run, God wants to put you and I in the land of more than enough. And I know by the spirit of God that that's what God wants to do. It's bless our lives and put us in the land of more than enough. Now, I'm not saying or uh, uh, giving the impression that everyone here is going to be a millionaire. OK, I went into that line and give that kind of false hopes. But what I will say is this. I am saying this, that God wants all of us to have enough that we can be a blessing to somebody else. Oh, I'm going to say it again. 
God wants us to have enough, then we can not only be blessed, but have enough to bless somebody else. Come on. And this is what I believe by the Spirit of God, that God wants from you and I, that God wants to bless us to be a blessing. Hear me, family. When God blesses us, he wants us to be conduits in the earth to help make someone else's life comfortable, to be a blessing in someone else's life. And I know you're saying, Pastor Larry, all they talk about is money, 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 money. And you know what? I'm not coming against how you believe. I understand there's crooked people every place. There's crooked folks in the doctor's office. There's crooked lawyers, crooked judges, crooked politicians. I understand that. I get that. There's crooked preachers in the pulpit. I get that. But listen, the word of God does not change because people abuse God's word. I'll say that again. The word of God does not change because there are those who abuse and misuse the word of God. God desires that you and I live in the land of more than, more than enough. This is why, listen, no one has a problem with Warren Buffett who has all kind of money. Come on, Bill Gates. No one has a problem with Bill Gates. He has all kinds of money. You see, no one has a, 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 a a problem with the guy who owns Facebook. He has all kind of money. Come on, Tyler Perry, all kind of money. Oprah Winfrey, all kind of money. They are living the abundant life that God desired for you and I to live as well as his children. I'm not saying they aren't God's children, but if you're living in the land of not enough, God wants to move you from not enough to more than enough. God wants you to be able to sponsor Whatever vision he has, whatever ministry you're in, whatever he has on the table of your heart, God wants to use your life and my life to help sponsor, to bring that dream to pass. Come on. How many folks have the 30-year have the, um, building fund plan? Come on. Oh, dear God. People have 25 and 30-year building fund because no one wants to fund God's agenda. And while everybody is praying, Lord, bless me. Lord, bless me. Lord, bless me. And the moment God blesses them, then they fail to fund the agenda that God, the agenda that God blessed them to fund. But listen, listen, when God blesses you, it's because God has an agenda that he wants those he has blessed to help fund, help maintain, to help get started, to help set up. Why? Because he wants to establish his kingdom in the earth. And watch this to show those who don't know him how good it is for his children to live the abundant life. Good God Almighty. Well, I feel something all up in here right there because God wants you and I to live the good life. I'll prove it to you. Look at John 10.10, 10, the B part of the verse. You know it. He says, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it. What's the it, Pastor Larry? The abundant life that they might have it more abundantly. Now, maybe you don't believe in abundant life, but you can't pull that out the Bible. Come on, somebody. You cannot pull that out of the scripture. Jesus died so that you and I could have a more abundant life to bless us to be a blessing so that you can bless your family, bless those in your ministry, bless those around you, bless those who are homeless and need help. God wants to use your life and my life as a conduit in the earth to make sure somebody's life can be blessed. Good God Almighty. I better move on before I stay there the rest of the night. Praise God. And so uh, on last week, you all, we began to discuss ways to gain access to this abundant living. Ways to gain access to this abundant living. Now, I gave you point number one. My point number one was we must deny doubt the right to set up residence in our mind. I'll say it again. We must deny doubt the right to set up residence in our mind. In other words, you and I must on purpose kick doubt out of our mind. Listen, doubt is an enemy to your faith. I'll say it again. Doubt is an enemy to your faith and to my faith. And so we, we must then on purpose kick doubt. Pastor, what is doubt? Watch this. 
Doubt is when I question God's ability. That's doubt. Doubt is when we question God's ability. When we question, can God do it? When we question, will God do it? You recall the man, he said, Lord, I know you can, but will you do it for me? Right? He had leprosy. He said, Lord, I know you can, but will you do it for me? He had doubt. He knew what he could do, but the question was, would he do it for him? And there are many of us who are questioning God's ability to do things for us. Oh, dear God, I could turn the corner right there, but I won't. And so that we must we must deny doubt the right. Listen, take back the keys from doubt and lock doubt out of your mind. Don't let it set up residence. Don't let it move in your mind. I said, number two, you must make the decision to refuse and embrace the images the devil plants in your head. Come on. We must make a decision to refuse to embrace the images the devil puts in our head. Let me say for you again. You and I must ref make a decision to refuse to embrace the images the devil plants in our head. There was an old uh, proverb that said, you can't keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your head. And if you and I allow the enemy to set up residence in our head and put these images in our minds and plant these seeds in our head, listen, those seeds, those images set up residence, they grow roots. And before you know it, you'll find yourself not operating in faith and trust in God. And so it is our job to refuse to embrace it. Okay, the devil may give you an idea. He may talk to you. Get rid of the thought. Cast it down. Get rid of it. Get it out of your head. Pastor why? Because if we don't, we give the devil permission to rule our lives, to reign in our lives, and have control over our thought process. All right? So listen, let's move on. Write this down, will you? Told you also last time, the enemy can get you. I'm sorry, what the enemy can get you to, to believe, what he can get you to focus on. He can get us to believe whatever he can get us to focus on. I'm going to say it again. The enemy can get us to believe whatever he can cause us to focus on. This is crucial. You and I can't allow him to cause us to focus on anything that is outside the parameters of what God has already said. One of the reasons Eve bit the forbidden fruit was because she began to focus on the very thing God told them not to eat. And anytime you and I focus on something outside the boundary which God himself has set, we set ourselves up for failure. That's the way you mean. If the enemy can get us to focus on those negative thoughts and those negative images in our head, he will wear you out and wear you down. And so you and I can't focus on those images and those things that go on go on in our head. Listen, even if he wakes you up in the, in the, in the middle of the night and start bombarding your mind with negative thought processes, you got to begin to open your mouth and plead the blood of Jesus over your thought life and refuse to allow him to take up residence in your mind. And focus on those things that are not uh, conducive to the will of God for your life. The Bible said, think on those things that are lovely and pure and of good report. He says, think on these things. Right? And so what he's simply saying is, don't allow the enemy to change your focus. Keep your focus and attention on the things of God. Now, tonight, I want to take us you all in a journey to help all of us find a path to getting our life back. Come on, how many of you all want to get your life back? Woo, good God Almighty. I know your pastor. I want to get my life back. I see you, Chris. I sure will. I'll call you. It is time for you and I to get our life back. It is time for us to quit being held hostage by the enemy, right? Pastor, who's the enemy? Satan and his imps. 
whatever principality is holding you back, holding us back, it is time for us to take our life back. Whatever principality sent by Satan to keep us from living the life God designed for us, it is time for you and I to get our life back. You see, one of the challenges you all that many Christians face is having the ability, watch this now, to see a situation and even go through one and still see themselves as victorious and not as victims. Come on. One of our greatest challenges is to be in a situation yet still see myself as a victim. You know, I can't begin to tell you how many Christians you all I run into every day who bear the victim mentality. You know, always play the victim as though they can't change it. You know, one of the scriptures, my mother, uh, I believe is her most favorite one. She says it every time we talk, uh, Romans 8.28. That says, and we know all things work together for our good to them who love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Now watch this. There are many Christians, you all, who quote that scripture, but they don't believe it. I'm going to figure it again. They quote it, but they don't believe it. I'm not saying her. I'm saying many Christians. They quote it, but don't believe it. I'll tell you why or how I know that. Because if you believe that God was working things out for your good, you wouldn't complain as much. If you believe that God was working things out for our good, we wouldn't whine about every little thing. If we believe that God was working things out for our good, we wouldn't have a, a, a pity party every other day. If we believe that God was working things out for our good, we would live. Uh, knowing that I'm victorious in every area of my life. But I can tell when people are just quoting that verse and believe it because the Apostle Paul says, and we know. He didn't say we guess. He did not say based on how I feel. He says, the one thing I know, he says, and I know that all of this is working together for my good. Which means then sometimes the thing that's working together for your good, you don't always understand it. See, Joseph didn't understand everything he was going through. He didn't. When his brothers threw him in the pit, he didn't understand. When they hated him the more, he did not understand. Right? When he was sold in slavery, he did not understand that. When he got put in prison, he did not understand that. When Potiphar's wife accused him of doing something he didn't do, he didn't understand that. But if you keep on reading the whole story, in Genesis 50, Joseph said, what you meant for evil against me, God meant it for my good. Woo, man, what a powerful scripture. He says, what you meant for evil against me, all the trouble, all the pain, all the tears I shed, all the days and times of inconvenience, I had to go through. Joseph said, what you meant for evil against me, God meant it for my good. I see Mother Sergeant put in the chat room. She said, it's been tried and proven. Oh, good God Almighty. Come on. How many of you are in the chat can testify? It's been tried and proven. Praise God. <clears throat> it's been tried and proven that every time I go through a thing that I think is going to take me under, God takes it and turns it around for my good. Good God Almighty. But what's this wrong? When you're going through it, come on, there's the hard part. When we're going through it, what the devil often does is makes us feel as though we are victims. Listen, whatever you're going through does not make you a victim. It is simply an opportunity for God to show his hand in your life. Somebody better catch that. Whatever you're going through is simply an opportunity for God to show his hand in your life. Pastor Larry, make that make sense. I don't care if it's a sickness. It's a time for God to show his hand strong in your life. Disease, it's time for God to show his hand strong in your life. Maybe it's a divorce. 
<clears throat> it's a time for God to show himself strong in your life. Come on, maybe you got fired. It's a time for God to show himself strong in your life. Listen, all of us have had opportunities where God has shown himself strong in our lives. And when folks ask you, how did you get through it without losing your mind? You say, I don't know. And guess what? You don't know. But I'll tell you how it was nobody but Jesus. When folks say, how did you get through it? Come on, and didn't throw it in a towel. I'll tell you how it was nobody but Jesus. Listen, all the credit goes to him for every deliverance. It goes to him for every breakthrough in my life. The credit goes to him for every great outcome. It all goes to him. And so when we look at it in that direction, now we can live even in bad times. We can see ourselves as being victorious and never again a victim. As a matter of fact, I need somebody to put in the chat room, never again the victim. Come on. I know it's early, but come on. Somebody put in the chat room, never again the victim. Yeah, I know you're saying, Pastor Larry, but you don't understand. They hurt me. Okay, they hurt you, but you are not a victim. Come on. They did you wrong, but you are not a victim. Come on. They lied on you. Yes, but you are. I wish somebody put in the chat room, never again the victim. Why? Because you are a child of the most high God. Praise our God. See, what the enemy wants to do is have us to embrace this victim mentality to keep us looking at a situation and or the, the person who brought it in our lives. Listen, you cannot help who brings trouble in your life. I wish we get that. We, God does not give us the option to pick who brings trouble in our lives. I wish he did. <laughs> but guess what? You don't get to pick who brings trouble in your life. Come on. Or who hurts you. But what you can do is make a decision. I will not play the victim. Why? Brother Taylor got he says, because we are never alone. I say you, LT. He says, we are never alone. Which means then, so the Pope, I never again have to play the victim. Come on. You never have to be a victim if you know you walk in the victory that the blood of Jesus paid on Calvary for us to walk in. Consider this. How many times have you been involved in a situation and you thought what the, you thought what could happen was more terrifying than what was going to happen? Come on, how many times have the devil played games in your mind with the thought of what could happen? And it was worse than what actually happened. Or check this out. Or has someone ever caused something negative in your life and you invested most of your good energy on what they did and you closed all the avenues for God to walk you through it? Hear me tell God, when we spend our time focusing on what people do to us, let me pause for, for a second here. Because sometimes what we really want is retribution. God get them. God punish them. God kill them. God hurt them. Listen, the folk who did you wrong, don't miss this, God loves them too. Oh, I know it's hard to receive but God loves them too. Consider this. If God was to give us what we deserve every time we messed up and missed it, if God was to give us what we deserve every time we hurt somebody, I wonder what kind of punishment would God be giving us? Come on. While we always talk about who hurt us, I wonder how many of us have also hurt somebody. Oh, the chat room got quiet there. Lady Carol got quiet there, girl. I ain't, getting, I ain't getting no amens there. But that's the reality. While people have hurt us, we have also hurt somebody. My question is this. What if God gave us what we deserve? Right? And this is what grace you all is about. Some of the folks you want to get back, listen. What if the person who hurt you want to apologize? But because you closed the avenue, 
you don't give them room to apologize. Now, now understand why a, an apology does not change what has happened. But watch this. In order to be saved, watch this now. In order to be saved or to repent, repent means to ask for forgiveness. That's all God asked for you and I. And so then here's my question. Why do we require more than what God requires? If God gave his son Jesus, who went through who went through a hellacious death, a terrible punishment for our redemption, and he said, repent and turn to him and accept him and what he did on Calvary. And then he says, if we miss it, to repent, say I'm sorry and turn around. Now, if that's what if that's all he requires, why then do you and I require more than what God requires? And people can never get healed. People can never get their lives on track. Because when they try to repent, many times we don't let them repent. We hold them captives. We hold them hostage. Watch this now. And now that door is open. Here's the sad part. While you are still hurting and not being healed, guess what? They're hurting and they can't be healed. And so now everyone attached to you and them, no one gets healed. No one gets set free. And now watch this. Consider this. What if the person who hurts you gets saved? Give their life to Jesus. Or if they're already saved and both of you all die, guess what? You'll both be in heaven. Then what? Come on. Unless you want to leave heaven, that means for eternity, you all going to be stuck together. Amen. And so let's walk in forgiveness. Write this down. I, I believe this here bless you. Please write this down. Nobody and nothing is worth your peace. Ooh, that's good, y'all. Come on, I'm going to say it again. Nobody and nothing is worth your peace. Come on. Nobody and nothing is worth your peace. Look at Romans 8, 37. I believe this here, bless you. He says, nay in all things, I'm sorry, he said, nay in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Ooh, come on, class. Don't miss this. Nay in all things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Pastor, what does that mean? I'm glad you asked. You are a good class. It's one thing to be a conqueror, have victory. But Paul here paints the picture that not only are we, are we conquerors, but we are above. We, when, in other words, when God brings us out, it's not just a victory, it's a resounding victory. Come on. He didn't just bring you out, but he erased all the pain, all the evidence, all the residue of what you're in. Let me give you an uh, illustration. In Daniel, there was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who were thrown in the fiery furnace. The Bible says this. It says that when the king had the fire turned up seven times hotter, that the fire burnt off their ropes, but it did not touch their hair or singe their garments. Not only that, when the king looked into the fiery furnace, he said, wait a minute, we put in three, but I see the fourth one, and it looks like the son of God. Now, don't miss this here. Not only did God give them victory while they were in the fire. See, so you're praying, God, don't ever let me get in the fire. He said, no, get in the fire because I'm your peace in the fire. Come on, get in the fire. Because I'm your joy in the fire. 
get in the fire. I am your substance in the fire. Come on, get in the fire. I'm your great supply in the fire. See, we're all running from the fire, but God is our peace in the fire. And watch this. Here's what I love about God. That God will show himself to your enemy, even if he does not show himself to you. Good God Almighty. I'm getting ready to run up out of here right now. I say God will show himself to your enemy. Those who do you wrong and persecute you. Tell of God, he will show himself strong. He will manifest his presence to those who do you wrong, even though we don't see him. So God says, don't trip. And then all these things, you are more than a conqueror through him that loved you. Glory to God. Now, look at this same verse, you all, in the CEB translation. It's good. Watch this. It says, but in all these things, we win a sweeping victory through the one who loved us. Oh, good God Almighty. Ooh, y'all catch that? He says, in all these things, we win a sweeping victory. Pastor, I didn't get that one. I'm going to give you one more. Look at it in the God's Word translation. That's the GW translation. Look at what it says. It says, the one who loves us gives us, watch this, you all, an overwhelming victory. Woo, somebody come get me. I mean, I'm going to shout right now. It says, the one who loves us. Child God, who loves you? Jesus loves you. I wish somebody, come on. I know y'all. I, I know, I'm sorry. But please, somebody put in the chat room. I know he loves me. Come on. Y'all, I, I wish y'all could feel what I feel tonight. Put in the chat room. I know he loves me. If you are sure beyond the shadow of a doubt that he loves you, would you please put in the chat room? I know he loves me. Come on, do it with an attitude. Come on, I know he loves me. Oh, dear God, I wish they had an emoji that said, I know he loves me. You know why? Because I know God loves me. Come on, in spite of my failures, he loves me. All my faults, he loves me. Bad attitude and all, he loves me. Come on, my obeying him, he loves me. My not obeying him, he loves me. Because that's the God he said, I know, listen, let me tell you something. In a hard place, Hear me, class. In a hard place, you better know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you know, that you know in your know, that you know and know on top of your know that he loves you. Come on. I need y'all to put in the chat room. I know he loves me. Come on. I, I Listen, I, there is no doubt about it that I know God loves him some Larry. Woo! Listen, I know Lady Carol loved me. But I, I'm, I know God loves him, Larry. Come on. Come on. I know my mama loved me, but she already told me, if I get in trouble, don't call her. <laughs> Guess what? If I'm ever in trouble, I can always call Jesus. Come on. Always call Jesus. He won't tell me, don't call him. He won't tell me, don't, don't look to him. Matter of fact, he says, when I'm in trouble, he says, he'll be right there. Woo, come on, somebody. put it. Come on. Put in the chat room, I know he loves me. Somebody should be shouting right there. Y'all, I feel the preacher coming on. Come on, I know he loves me. In spite of everything I go through, I know he loves me. The one who loves me gives us an overwhelming victory. Watch this, you all, in all these difficulties. That's the GW version. Now, Pastor, you said in all these difficulties. Pastor, what difficulties are you referring to? You got to backtrack in Romans, the eighth chapter. Look at verse 35. Paul says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? That's the love of the anointing. Shall tribulation, ooh, good God Almighty, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or perils, or sword. Did y'all see that? He says, what's going to separate us from the love of, of Christ? Can being inconvenienced in tribulation or, 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 or anxiety 
distress, persecution, force coming against me, famine, not having enough money, nakedness, not being clothed. Come on, perils of sword. He says, as it is written, verse 36, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Can you imagine that? See, about all the stuff we just mentioned, he says, you are still more than a conqueror, which means then that my situations does not stop my success. Ooh, somebody should catch that right there. I said, your situation does not stop your success. Your situation does not stop your success. Listen, what God has for your life and my life, there is no plan the devil can bring up, conjure up, that can stop the plan of God for my life and for your life. So question, so pastor, how do we keep this winning attitude while being in a troubled situation? Boy, you all are a good class. I love y'all. Y'all y'all are good class. I heard you saying, well, pastor, what do I do? You don't get it, pastor. I, I've been crying. I messed up. My mind jacked up. My body jacked up. My pressure going up. My heart palpitation. I ain't got no friend. Can't tell anybody about what's going on in my world. I'm a wreck, Pastor. Nothing is going right. How can I keep a winning attitude while I'm in a troubled situation? Ooh, you came on on the right time of the night. Turn to 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. Look at verse 18. Come on, class. 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. Look at verse 18. Come on. You all been blessed tonight? Oh, Mother Tana, still my scripture. Paul says, Paul said, these light afflictions, but I, I got to move on. Are y'all there? Second Corinthians chapter four, verse 18. He says, while we look not, come on class, you see it? While we look not at the things which are seen, <clears throat> but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Y'all, that's a mouthful, but let's make this make sense. Come on. Now, let's dig and let's dissect this text. All right? The first thing here, I'm going to give you three things to write down. Okay? Number one, write this down. The first thing you got to do is not focused on the obvious. That's first and foremost. You cannot focus on the obvious. Come on, class. We cannot focus on the obvious. It's right there in the text. Paul says, while we look not at the things which are seen. He says, we cannot focus on the obvious. Many of us spend so much time focusing on what we see. Listen, anytime you keep adding fuel or gas to a burning fire, it only burns more. Right? Anytime your mouth begins to agree with what you see, you only get more of it. Right? Anytime we keep confessing and saying the same things, rehearsing it over and over again, we only make it bigger. And it's not that God diminishes. We now make our problem bigger than God in our eyesight. Right? And so Paul says not to focus on the obvious. Yes, we see what's going on. Yes, we know the problem. Yes, God knows the issue. But God does not want us focusing on that. Now, this sounds like an oxymoron. How can God ask us to not focus on what we see? But then he says, watch this, number two. He says, to look at what's not seen. Write that down. He says, to not look at what is not seen. Now, how do I look at what's not seen? That's almost impossible because you're saying, Pastor Larry, how in the world can I see what is not seen? Y'all, write this down. I'll tell you why. Because 
what I'm expecting has to be inside of me before it manifests. What I'm expecting is inside of me. I have to see what's inside of me before it manifests. Oh, Pastor Larry, what do you mean? Class, watch this. That's all worry is. Worry is thoughts or images inside of us. Things that haven't happened yet, but they carry the emotion of the actual event. That's all worry is. I'm worried they're going to evict me. But you're still in the house. Been there nine months. Watch this waiting for an eviction notice. But you've been there for nine months already. They're going to turn off my lights. But the lights are still on. Why are you worried? They don't cut my gas off, Pastor Larry. You don't get it. Is the gas on now? Then stop worrying about it. It's on now. Don't worry about what you can't change. That's all what this worry is simply an image on the inside of us. So here's my question. How many times have you found yourself stressing out over a possible event? Come on, <laughs> come on, over a possible event that has not happened. Come on, I know it's not just Pastor Larry. How many times have a thought or an image gone through your head and you begin to stress out over the thoughts, right? It's not happened, but you thought about it. Come on, you, you, you're, going, you're going on a trip, on an airplane. The devil tells you, the plane going to crash. You are still at home. You are two weeks out of, from getting on the plane. The devil makes you believe the plane crash is so real, you are freaking out while you're at home. Get on, going to the airport, you freaking, you're panicking. Going to the airport. Get in the airport. You can barely breathe. <laughs> Come on. Dear God, you, you are on, you're now on the plane. You need all kind of medication to knock yourself out. Why? Because the devil has given you an image in your head that is so real that he makes you believe something that has not happened. And all of us have been there. Come on. During the pandemic, fear of dying, fear of catching COVID. Come on. All these fears, fears of running out of money, running out of food. Come on. Fear of being in the house and just trapped. Here you are a prisoner in your own house. And now you're telling God, but God, uh, 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 I'm trapped. I'm a prisoner in my own house. No, child of God, you aren't a prisoner. Are you following me? And the enemy will give you these images. I mean, come on. You, you, you almost see your own funeral and you in the casket. That's a, a trick of the enemy to tear, what's this, to tear up your mind, your thought process. If it keeps you focused long enough, you will never see yourself walking in the victory that Jesus has already provided for us. And so watch this, y'all. This then is the real power of meditation. Write this down. The power of meditation, it gives us the convincing ability to see what is not seen as though it has already been obtained. Ooh, somebody get me to shout right now. Come on. So the glory of said an illusion. Watch this. I'm going to say it again. Meditation, it gives us the convincing ability to see what is not seen as though it has already been obtained. Ooh, if I was in church, I would tell you, how many of y'all ever been hungry and you've seen yourself with the food you wanted? See, this is what you all, they do when, uh, when they put these ads up. Come on, these commercials. They put these commercials on TV to cause you to meditate and see yourself either wearing it, driving it, eating it. Come on. And these things are designed to take what you see, get in your head, and give you an image that you don't see only in one place is in your head. 
once it gets in your head, it moves to your heart. Once it gets in your heart, they know that you will begin to take action. You will buy stuff you can't afford, get in debt you can't afford to be in, come on and eat food you shouldn't be having. Are you following me? It's all because you meditated on the image. And so when Paul says to look at what is not seen, meditation gives us an avenue to see what is not seen and respond as though we already have it. See, this is why you can thank God for your healing while you're hurting. Ooh, come on, Sister Barbara. I can thank God for my healing while I'm hurting because my meditation says with his stripes, I'm healed. And so when I see myself healed, I see myself whole. The reason I can praise God is because on the outside, I may still walk with a limp, but on the inside, the image that I see in me, that's not visible to the natural eye, but in my spirit eye, in the eyes of the spirit, I see myself healed and no longer hurting. Therefore, I can praise God from the perspective of what I see in the spirit realm. Are you hearing me? And this, you all, Brother Thomas, is what God wants us to do. God wants us to see ourselves whole. Even if I'm still hurting, see myself healed. See myself uh, with a breakthrough in my life. We Listen, see it on the inside before it manifests on the outside. See, y'all, watch this. Meditation not only helps us see what is not seen, but it also, come on, write this down. It is also the motivating factor that keeps us moving in the right direction. Woo! Help me, Holy Ghost. I said it's the motivating factor that keeps us moving in the right direction. Pastor, make that make sense. That when I meditate on God's word, it, the word of God, keeps me focused. When I meditate, what I meditate on keeps me moving in the right direction. See, I can tell what you meditate on by your response. I'm going to say it again. I can tell what you meditate on by your response. See, when Lady Carol was pursuing me, it only meant she had me on her mind. She was hunting me down. I was on her mind. She's over there. It's my sermon. It's my story. I'm going to tell it the way I see it. <laughs> Glory to God. All right? I'm going to tell it the way I see it. Listen, she was meditating. I'm going to, that dude there, I'm going to get him. I'm going to, 6'2", come on, 6'2 and a half, 180, come on. I'm going to, I'm going to get, I'm going to get him. And she would call me. She would stalk me all the time. Okay, I'm okay, okay, okay. That's my story. And it sounds good, though, didn't it? But watch this. Here's the reality. Meditation is the motivating factor that keeps us moving in the right direction. It keeps us pushing in that direction. It keeps, watch this, it helps us to stay focused. <clears throat> One of the reasons a builder had the architect do a blueprint and so it keeps him focused, right? You draw out a plan to make sure I stay on track. And so when you go home, I meditate on the blueprint until I see the finished product, even though I'm still laying a foundation. Come on. I see the building already built, even though we're still digging a hole. That's what God wants us to do when it comes to living the abundant life. You may not have it all right now, but God wants us to see ourselves living on the top. See yourself living that good life. Why? Why you're still laying your foundation, doing what it takes to get there, still sowing seeds, still making confession, still tithing, still giving, still helping out your ministry. God wants us to see ourselves living the good life while we're still doing what it takes to get there. Look at Joshua uh, 1 and 8. Joshua 1 and 8. Y'all come on, oh dear God. 
Y'all, I got to move. Time is moving fast. Oh, my God. You got so much to give you. Come on. You all been blessed tonight? Man, man, man. Now I got to move fast now. All right. Watch this, y'all. That's what one and eight. He says, this book of the law, the Bible, shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou may observe to do according to all that is written therein. Here we go, y'all, right here. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Let me give you three things the word of God should do for you. All right? Three things you and I need the word to do. Watch this now. Number one, come on, write it down. I have to keep the word in my mouth to keep my image clear in my heart. Ooh, come on, class. Don't miss this. Come on. Come on. Come on. I got eight minutes to go. I have to keep the word in my mouth to keep my image clear in my heart. I have to keep the word in my mouth to keep the image clear in my heart. Let me see if I can make it make sense. In our church, we have a camera. If you take the camera out of focus, while I may still be there, and a person can see an image, they can't see clear. And so someone has to inform the person on the camera, say, hey, the image is not clear. And so someone must release words and give direction in order to put the camera back in focus to keep the image clear in the frame. You must use the word of God in your mouth to help keep the image clear in your heart. All right? Number two, come on, class, write it down. I have to keep thinking about the word. I have to keep thinking. That's called meditation. I have to keep thinking about the word to keep my image clear in my head. And so I talk it out to keep it clear in my heart. I think about it, keep it clear in my head. Watch this now. Then number three, come on, write it down. I have to do the word to make sure my actions are pursuing what I'm expecting. Woo, come on, Claire, don't miss this. I have to do the word to make sure my actions are pursuing what I'm expecting. Pastor, make that make sense. I will say this. It says, be doers of the word. Not hearers only, deceiving yourself. Come on, class, are you here? We have to be doers of the word. Yes, you speak it. Yes, you think it. But the Bible says, faith without works is dead being alone. In other words, faith without corresponding actions profit you nothing. Come on, you can cook food, take all day preparing it, but until you fix your plate and eat the food in your plate, you can't complain about being hungry because faith without corresponding action is no good. In other words, I must do something. Now, it does not mean I'm helping God out. But don't miss this. God is not obligated to do for you what you can do for yourself. Ooh, that was good. Somebody kept I wish I already put that in my notes, but I'm going to say it again. God is not obligated to do for you what you can do for yourself. I'm going to say it again. God is not obligated to do for you what you can do for yourself. Pastor, what do you mean? Let me give you some Bible. Over in Mark chapter 5, here it is, the woman with the, with the issue of blood. The Bible says she heard that Jesus was passing by, right? 
no doubt she heard of all the miracles she had performed earlier. Now, the Bible said, she said, if I may touch it, but it's closed. Some verses say the hem of his garment. I shall, I shall be made whole. Now watch this now. She heard the word. She said the word. What she heard gave her an image of being healed. She saw herself being healed. So she said. What she said gave her an image in her heart. She said, oh, dear God, if I can just touch but the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. Now, if she had only heard and only said, while, while that was good, but faith without corresponding actions is dead. The Bible says, it's in your text. It says, and she pressed. She pressed her way through the crowd, which means then what was in her head and in her heart caused her to move. Ooh, come on, class. If you and I are going to live the abundant life, it must move from our head, get to our heart, yes, but then allow it to cause a corresponding action. In other words, when God gives me a command, God may give you an unusual command to sow a seed. Obey God. God may give you a direction to be a blessing to someone's life, whether it's in your family, whether it's wh whoever. Obey God. Because watch this. Whenever God gives us command, watch this. When God gives us a command to do anything, it will line up with the vision he's already placed in our heart. Right? And God wants to get, a, un, get an unusual blessing to you. And many times when God wants to give us an unusual blessing, it will come at the expense of an unusual request. Come on. This girl, she heard, she said, but then it had to move her to action to do, watch this, to do something that she should have never done. The law said she should have never touched a rabbi, a priest. She could have been stoned to death for putting her hands on Jesus. But watch this. It was what she saw. Paul says, don't look at what you see. That's the obvious. It was obvious she could have been killed. But he says, look at what was not seen. While on the outside, she was not healed. But she saw herself. She had an image on the inside, and she saw herself healed. Tonight, my question for you is this. Listen, here's my challenge tonight for you. I want you to put in the chat room tonight. Put in the chat room what you see yourself obtaining. Come on, be bold. Come on, take bold steps tonight. I want you to put in the chat room what you see yourself obtaining. Come on, I'll wait on you. Whatever it is, if it's being healed, put in there, I see myself being healed. If it's being an a, 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 a entrepreneur, you want a, a restaurant, put in there, I see myself owning a restaurant. Come on. If it's a salon, I see myself owning a salon. Come on. Don't just listen. It's more than just thinking it. You might, my friend, have to be willing to say it because until you can say it, it's not root to you. See, Pastor Larry, I see myself building our new church. Come on. I see myself building our empowerment center. I see myself uh, uh, building the uh, uh, facility for a uh, daycare for seniors. Come on. I see that. Come on. It's in my spirit. I see it. I see ourselves feeding the homeless. I see myself walking in total life wholeness. Come on, I see it. Amen. I see it. Come on, you have to be willing to say what you see. Come on. Someone said, I, say, I see myself being an entrepreneur. One said, I see myself being rich. 
Come on. What do you see yourself doing? Because if you can't say it, that means you really don't see it. But if I can see it, I can see what I say. Because what you say paints an image. Right? What you say paints an image. Jesus said, Mark 11, he says, you can have whatsoever you say. Right? Which means then if you don't say it, it means you don't want it. If you don't say it, it means you can't see yourself having it. Come on. Come on. I see myself having houses and land. I see myself employing hundreds of people. Come on. I see that. That's my dream. That's my vision. Come on. I see myself buying blocks and acres of land and building a whole community within the community. Come on. I see that. Because if I can see it and see it in the word, Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Time is gone. Put it in the chat room. What can you see yourself with? Come on. Now, some of you all, the devil is challenging you. You don't believe that. If you see it, listen, anything you can see is obtainable. Come on. I see myself healed. Yes. Come on. Put it in the chat room. I see myself being whole. Come on. Put it in the chat room. I see all my kids being saved. Come on, put it in the chat room. I see all my kids working in ministry. Come on, put it in the chat room. I see all my kids loving God with all their heart. Yes, put it in the chat room. I see my grandkids to the 10th generation loving God. Yes, put it in the, come on. You have to see it, child of God. See it and say it and believe God that you receive it. Glory to God. Come on. Listen, while you all are putting it in the chat room, listen, you don't want to miss Wednesday. Man, it's going to be good. All right? On Wednesday night, I'm going to tell you right here. On, on Wednesday night, I'll pick up right here. I'll pick up with, we need to familiarize ourselves with the will of God. Woo! Y'all, that's going to be good. We need to familiarize ourselves with the will of God. You don't want to miss that, man. That's powerful right there. Because when you know the will of God, man, mm, 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 mm. when you know the will of God, it's like putting rocket fuel in a rocket. It's time to take off. Oh, listen, you don't want to miss Wednesday night. Man, it's going to be good. And also, listen, you also don't want to miss Friday. We're going to be in our time of Sunday school. You don't want to miss Friday night. Listen, y'all, I, I, I'm out of here. But y'all blessed tonight. I pray that you all are blessed tonight. And thank y'all for, for those who are uh, behind the scenes helping Pastor out. Thank y'all. Lo 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 love y'all so much. Aren't y'all Pastor Larry? Gotta get out of here. I'm, I'm over time. As we always say, you stay in faith and stay focused and know that God has you in the palm of his hand. All right, tonight I pray. Sweet rest over your life, your family, divine protection, and warring angels surround your life. God bless you. I love you. Listen, if God is leading you to sow into our ministry, this is good ground. Obey God. And if God is leading you to sow, we have different uh, avenues whereby you can sow into this uh, our ministry. Every dime goes into the work of the kingdom of God. Come on. Bless us to be a blessing. All right, y'all. Gotta go. I'll see you Wednesday night if God stay the same. God bless you. Good night. We out.